This is why we, Jake and Gino, are the premier multifamily community out there because of what Jay said. Buy right, finance right, manage right is not a slogan. It's the yeah. reality. Hello and welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, and mentor. Today's guest is Jay Bazaga. He is a software engineer turned real estate investor who acquired $5 million of property before the age of 30. And guess what? He turned the big 3-0. Jay will also celebrate his second anniversary with the Jake and Gino community in just a few days. Welcome to the show, Jay. Gino, thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be on here. Whew. On the 30. So Man, let's, I, I let's just jump 30. right in. Let's just jump right in. So this is important because sure. we always get people jumping on and saying, I can't get into multifamily. I'm too young. I don't have enough money. What made you want to get into multifamily at such a young age? Yeah. So, you know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I think for a while, I thought that would take the form of being like a, the, a CEO of some kind of unicorn tech startup. <laughs> you have to remember that when I, I grew up in the, the early 2010s, and so everybody's prime idea of successful entrepreneurship was like rich tech startup nerd. Um, so coming from a family of engineers, I really kind of seemed poised for that. But, you know, I realized <laughs> at some point, what I wanted to do was like, I loved, I always loved the the get rich slow aspect of real estate in general. Mm -hmm. um, I knew it was something I wanted to do, but, and this will be a, I think a consistent theme throughout this podcast is just going past limiting beliefs of, I can't do X, it, it, you know, sometimes I can't do X until I do Y, but really pushing past that uh, in the early part of the pandemic, I was just like, you know, this is something I've wanted to do. And I'm just going to like, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of the momentum and the excitement that I have now and do it. So I bought six units in 2021, the year I started. And uh, then I ran out of money. So <laughs> which tends to happen um, <laughs> if, if you go if you go fast. Um, and the fact was, Gino, I like, you know, you're all about partnership. And I think everybody in the community is really about uh, you know, partnering with people, especially where you're lacking. I was tired of relying on my own um, intuition, let's say mm -hmm. my own experience and intuition and being able to leverage like I don't have to know how to do everything myself and I can leverage partnerships. And, you know, at the same time, this is kind of getting into my why I made the switch to multifamily. It was getting over the limiting belief of, OK, well, I can't do multifamily. I can't do larger deals until I've done small deals for you know, X number of years. And I remember there was something very specific that I saw that uh, Brandon Turner said on a podcast. He said, it was something like, if I could go back and tell my younger self just one thing, you know, after 22 decades of experience, however many years, he said it would be to do larger deals sooner because you, you don't have to just wait until you reach a certain threshold in order to start doing larger deals. And that was like the one thing that he would tell his younger self. And so I really, that was like a, a watershed moment for me. I was like, why am I just, why am I limiting myself? Um, and at the same time, you know, it was, it was kind of a turning point in my life because I, I was at a point in my tech career where I sort of had to choose between, um, to be honest, my integrity and uh, just continuing on the path I was on. Basically, I, you know, I was working for a very cool and by the way, the people I worked with were fantastic. So this is nothing at all against them. Um, a, a very cool Silicon Valley type unicorn company um, discovered they were doing things with shareholder money that I didn't find ethical at all and was pretty morally opposed to. And, you know, when I found out that they were doing this, it was pretty brazen. I said, OK, well. I have a choice here. I can, I can just try and keep coasting and live a duplicitous life and kind of compromise what animates me, you know, what drives me morally, ethically, or I can just kind of leave and take the jump and risk torpedoing my career for lack of a better word. Cause the fact is I knew I wanted to make a jump eventually. 
and this was just kind of providentially put in my way so I could uh -huh. have the opportunity to take that jump. Jay, let me ask you this question. You come from a family of engineers. Yep. You are now in multifamily. You're also a musician. What yes. did your family say about leaving a nice, cushy, unicornish, sexy job and going to buying buildings and playing the guitar? <laughs> you know, less. it was less weird that I was playing the guitar, the bass, um, because I also come from a family of musicians. Okay. All right. My, my dad, if you saw, like, I was recently, I was visiting my parents for, for Christmas. My wife and I went and visited them. And like every time I come home, he's got some new, like eclectic <laughs> instrument. I'll be uh -huh. like, "Dad, what's that sitting on the table?" Who'd be like, "Oh, that's the uh, that's that's the ancient uh, Canadian dulcimer that I got from eBay last week." Like, <laughs> and that's just that's just totally his thing. Um, so uh -huh. less weird about playing guitar, playing bass. Um, also less weird because I just um, I'll brag on my wife here. Because I know that you are also a musician, you have a passion for music. Um, just that's that's a relationship in my life that uh, that enhances my being able to express myself through music. Because she is the most talented person I know. Um, she's a music mm -hmm. teacher, and uh, and so I, man, it's uh, the the question was really how my family reacted, and I think the fact is they're uh, they're extremely supportive of me. All right. Even though, you know, I said before uh, on a LinkedIn comment a couple of days ago, somebody was talking about uh, coming from a family of entrepreneurs. Like, I am so thankful for my parents, for my family, because even though that wasn't buying buildings, you know, going out and doing things that are a little outside the status quo, wasn't really their thing. But they wanted to instill the principles of, you know, being true to yourself, um, being true to your faith. And really going after what you want in life um, as a basis for kind of whatever that me and my sister wanted to do. And they mm -hmm. support it wholeheartedly. So now you're reaching into your pockets. You've closed six units. There's lint in your pockets right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> what, do we, exactly. what do we do? Because we all come up against that. And, and mm -hmm. for me, early on, I partnered with my brother and I partnered with Jake on the first deal. Yep. On our second deal, I found another partner, Mike. That was four people on our second deal. Then on our third deal, Mike was really the big KP, the big money guy. We had money, but we didn't have the balance sheet. So right. we utilized him. And then by that third deal, we're refinancing the first and the second deal. And the money's coming there. Mm -hmm. And then, wow, syndication. What is syndicate? I have no idea what syndication is. So we started syndicating deals. So it's not lack of money. It's lack of experience. Mm -hmm. It's lack of creativity. Mm -hmm. It's lack of education. It's lack of a why. It's never time or money. If you are saying to yourself, I don't have the time or I don't have the money, I've got six kids and I'm not bragging right now, but if I can find the time to invest in real estate, create businesses and do all that, I just had enough strong enough why and I just raised my standards by really surrounding myself with people who I wanted to be around and who pushed me and who motivated me and who held me accountable. So back to the Lint comment, you run out of money, what's the next step? You're like, damn, I, I'm doing so good here. Yeah. I don't got any more money. What do I do now? What is the next step indeed? Uh, well, <laughs> for me, it looks like I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I know I want to get into larger deals. I want to get into multifamily. So I'm just going to start asking people, where the hell do I start? Um, so I started asking people around in my network, um, you know, the importance of a, just having a local network where you are is mm -hmm. huge. Uh, eventually, somebody directed me to Tate Seamer. Now, do you know Tate Seamer? I've heard of him, yes. Yeah, he's in Utah. He's a syndicator and operator out there. He is one of the biggest go-givers that I've ever met. Because I called this man cold one day, and he was just so generous with his time. It was ridiculous. And he said, look, if you want to get started here, you're going to have to, like, sure, you can go it alone, um, but it's going to be really, you know, it's going to be really trial and error. Like you said, if you want to, you can raise your standards enough to where you can do it more or less by yourself, but it's not, it's really not going to happen how I think you're envisioning it unless you get around the right people. Like you'll be so much farther ahead if you join, you know, a group like Jake and Gino. And I really, I evaluated a couple of groups and what I liked most about Jake and Gino is just the fact that you guys were focused on operations, you know, in a time you remember, you remember when money was free? 
That was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> Money was just free. It's it's just there. Um, and people were focused a lot on just buy, 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 like only the acquisition side. Jake and Gino was focused on the operations and the management. I said, that's the kind of people I want to be around because it's not always going to be buy, buy, buy. It's not always going to be free money. Um, and so that really, honestly, that sold me on you guys. And um, it's it's proven to still be the case two years in. Whew. It is. It's buy right, finance right. And manage right. Absolutely. And, and people have to understand that it is a business. It's scalable. That's the wonderful thing about it. And it is sexy to buy deals. It really is, oh, especially yeah. if you're a deal junkie. But go find a group that you can buy deals with and maybe leave the operations to somebody who can handle it. So once you join the community, what's the next steps? What's the next thing that, that Jay Bazaga does to start getting deal flow and to start getting opportunities come his way? The next thing he does is just spend a year learning and networking. Um, a year. Woof. People yeah. are like, I can't believe a year. But listen, yeah. I'm sure Jay went to college for four to get that <laughs> sexy job. Four. I'm just I got five. Five years. Five. Yeah. five. Okay. I thought Jay was smart enough to do it in four, but I guess not. It took him an mm -hmm. extra year. He was on his mom's time. Lab. He probably he probably slid there a little uh, bit. <laughs> uh, I was paying for that myself. So that yeah. That just shows I needed the extra year. <laughs> <laughs> but to my point, 12 yeah. months. Think about how quickly 12 months goes by. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about like passive education. We're talking about being active. It's education that you can actually implement. You're yeah. going to live events. You're going to money mixers. You're on weekly lessons. You're on mastermind calls. You're on accountability pods. The list goes on and on. You're not just sitting there passively watching some YouTube videos. You really got to dive in and really have to lock into what you need to focus on. And in the very beginning, it's deal sourcing. And it's capital sourcing. You need to focus on that. But then within the parameters of buy right, manage right, finance right. So after that one year, you've done all this work. What's the yeah. next thing? The next thing is, okay, I, I think I can reasonably bring enough capital to the table. I can bring a few hundred dollars to a deal and really you know, make that deal happen for somebody. Get on the operating team. Now, it's got to be, like you said, there's, there's, three, there's three parts to the wheelbarrow here. There's buy right finance right and manage right so i need to find an operator that's experienced enough to be able to do managing and financing have that strength of on the balance sheet so we can actually get the deal done mm -hmm. um and so i started reaching out to folks i knew in the jake and gino community saying hey it's been 12 months i feel like i know what i want i have a buy box i know what my investors want um very heavy on cash flow I love the Midwest. Do you know anybody who's doing any deals in the Midwest like this or are you? So I reached out to Leon Nguyen. Um, he's oh, been yes. in the group. Leon's awesome, but he's mostly focused in LA. It's not really my buy box, but he was like, look, I know a guy named Wakefield Lee, and he's been doing deals in Cincinnati for like eight years. He's awesome. I grew up <laughs> with the guy. So just, you know, I'll introduce you to him. So I started talking to Wakefield. We find out we're really aligned. And so now... I'm building more key relationships that I can use to get into that deal, uh, being able to leverage somebody else's deal flow, especially because um, after we found out we were aligned, he comes and says, hey, I got this deal and I got it because and this is kind of th this is this is one of those things that's not sexy, but you, you just got to do it is building deal flow by building relationships, you know, having the relationships with those brokers where, you know, Wakefield gets a deal sent to him and he sends in an offer, but it's not the highest offer. The broker still convinces the seller to take it because he knows we can close. That was how we won this deal. We were not at all the highest offer, but he showed me this deal and I said, okay, love this. Love what I see of the underwriting so far. You know, when are you going to be in Cincinnati? When can I see it? That was on a Friday. He's like, I'm leaving on Tuesday. I'm here. I'm, I'm in Cincinnati. I was like, awesome. I, I'll drive up on Sunday and we can go see it on Monday. Um, and so did that. We had lunch because I know, I mean, Gino, I, I've read I've read your posts. I've read your blogs. You 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 hold lunch in a very high place. And so <laughs> I <do>. I. <laughs> that's that's a big honestly, I think that's a big part because you can see how people treat wait staff, anybody else like it's it's a character thing. Mm -hmm. um, and just spending time with somebody is huge. But we start talking about, OK, I love this deal. I'm saying to him, I love this deal. I want to get on this deal. And he's, he says, okay, well, you know, I need this much capital. Uh, you know, we need this much. I was saying like, I can do investor relations. Look at the, the kind of funnels I have set up. Like 
I, I want to be doing this, making sure investors have a great experience in addition to, you know, just bringing capital. Like I, if I, if I'm going to be on this GP team, I want to be an important part of this GP team. So, so yeah, okay. I get that. Um, you know, I'm still looking at different partners. I said, okay, what, what else do we have that we can look at and say, this is what we need for this deal. He said, okay, we got about $75,000 in at-risk capital that we need to put down still. So earnest money and uh, rate lock, uh, that just money that would be at risk if the deal didn't close. And so I said, there, that is where I can add value where other people might not. Mm -hmm. So I went to my bank right after I got back from Cincinnati. I said, look, I need you to print me out some checks. They said, how many checks? I said, honestly, just, I need one. I don't, I'm not actually going to use it. I just need like, however few checks you can give me. They looked at me really weird, but they they printed me out a small book of checks. And I took it home and I got on a call with Wakefield. I said, look, you have $75,000 you need to get from all the partners, right? He said, yeah. I said, great. And I took the check and I, with him, you know, with my camera on me, I, I wrote $75,000 in the two line Wakefield Lee. And I held it up to the camera. I said, look, you put me on the team. I will cover all of the at-risk capital I'm going to take on significant risk because I believe in this deal and I want to be part of this team. And so that worked for him and he put me on. And if that deal went bad, you have a lot more lint in your pocket, but exactly. that's where the exactly. road, that's where the roads diverge. I mean, that's where somebody says, I'm afraid I may pee in my pants. Like Dr. Ben Hardy said, it was a great quote, but fear is peeing your pants. Courage is continuing to walk with your pants while they still got peeing on them, right? Yeah. And that, that that's the reality. That's a scary big check for someone who's barely 30 years old, who owns six units. That is a large sum of money because you have no control. The deal may close, the deal may not mm -hmm. close, but that is when you say to your partners, I'm convinced I actually have skin in the game. And if, yep. if a partner's looking for somebody like that, that's the kind of person that you're looking for to partner up. So when that happened, what, what walk me through the rest of the deal. How did the rest of the deal come to fruition? Sure. So, um, you know, the whole deal is it's, it's 76 units that we acquired in June in Cincinnati, um, C class seventies vintage. And the, the whole idea is that, you know, we're not, we're not getting something that's super distressed. Like I like, I love the Bill Ham approach where he says he's got a standing offer on anything that's 1.25 DSCR or more. Um, you know, enough DSCR to secure a Freddie SBL loan. So fixed financing for a term longer than our five-year hold. Um, so we know exactly what we're going to be paying from day one to the day we sell it. Um, and just going through and bringing these properties to their highest and best potential. Because I'll tell you what, one of the huge challenges here, and this is why it's so, so important to have a great asset management team, is that this is in a neighborhood that's kind of coming up right now. This is Northwest Cincinnati. 10, 20 years ago, maybe you don't want to live in Northwest Cincinnati, you know? Mm -hmm. But now, you know, we're, we're seeing revitalization in the neighborhood. And part of that effort is operators like us that are going in and taking assets that were owned by just slumlords. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. It's just people who didn't care about the quality of tenant mm -hmm. and they didn't care about the tenant experience at all. And mm -hmm. so as a result, the properties just went kind of went down the toilet. We take it from an operator who takes it from them says, okay, we got our spread. We're going to leave some meat on the bone for the next guys who want to just finish this value add. We are the next guys. Um, we're figuring out how we can leave meat on the bone for the next guy. But the fact is we have the opportunity here because that was created by distress that was turned into less distress with, you know, they're taking an outsized risk. They have their spread, they sell it to us. So that's the whole play is just bringing them up to the highest and best potential they have. This is why we, Jake and Gino, are the premier multifamily community out there because of what Jay said. Buy right, finance right, manage right is not a slogan. It's the yeah. reality because Jay didn't say to himself, I've got bridge debt and I'm, no, 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 no. Fixed rate debt. He doesn't have to worry about it. Are you going to lose a lot of deals? Yes. It's okay because no deal is better than a bad deal. But when you practice what you preach, you're de-risking. You're, you're mitigating your risk. And if you're going to fire on all cylinders and, and hats off to Jay because all those keywords, I don't know if people heard it, but I'm going to rephrase a lot of what he said. 
buy right box. So he's not going in there winging it. A year ago, Jay was probably saying to himself, I need a deal anywhere. What's a deal? But now he's like, you know what? I want a deal in this part of the city, this median income, this number of units, this vintage, 70s brick, whatever it looks like. So he's got his buy box. Finance right, he understands that short-term debt can be risky, especially if it's a larger asset and you need to move. So you know what? I may pass in a few deals, but if I can lock in debt for 10 years and if I'm only holding for five, I've got a much longer runway. So I take that off. If anyone's a student of history, go back to the 08 recession. That's what happened in 08. People were still cash flowing, but their debt came due and they couldn't refi because the values dropped. You're mitigating your risk by doing that. And the manager component is he has a plan of taking these units and saying to themselves, let me reposition these things. I'm going to add value to them. So when you, you know, you utilize the buy right, the finance right, and the manager right, and you package it together and you put a great team together, it's really hard to fail in this business. Most mm -hmm. people in the last 12 to 24 months have failed because they have violated the finance right portion of the framework. A lot of capital calls, a lot of distress, and it may not be their fault, but when you have COVID and it takes you eight months to buy windows and those labor shortages, that's part of risk. So when you have timelines, it's very challenging. So, you know, buy, manage finance. I'll leave it off with that. I can keep preaching, but I want you to follow up on that because I think to us, I, I really, I really pride myself on saying we are the premier multifamily yeah. community because yeah. of that, because of the quality of the individuals that we have. I mean, you've only been in this in this industry for a year and what you've said right there, most people in the business for 20 years wouldn't understand that. They've been through market cycles and they're still buying risky debt. They still mm -hmm. don't understand why. We went to an event, uh, a syndicator event the last year, Jake and myself, we were on stage. We asked all the attendees, how many of you have a buy right criteria? And these are all super high level syndicators. It was crickets. Not mm -hmm. one person even knew what a buy right criteria is. So we're like, you just buy deals on a whim. You don't know what you're buying. You, I mean, it was it, it was nice. It was, the OM looked nice. You know, <laughs> it was bizarre to me. But like, like follow up. Yeah. Let, let me hear your thoughts on pull some stuff out that I just said that really resonated with you. And you're like, yeah, you're right there. And let me add on to that. If you could add anything onto that, it would be great as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know the talk about uh, and thank you for saying all that. By the way, I. I am very happy to be part of a community that prides itself on the right things, puts the first things first, because like you said, buying deals is awesome. It that's one of the reasons why I love it. It's frankly, it's awesome. It's badass. I love it. It's 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 very fun. But the fact is, it's also I mean, it's also a business. It's responsibility and putting the first things first in your family, in your faith, in your health, in your business is like that comes before everything and not always, you know, you, you got the, you got the four quadrants, the, the stuff that's urgent, uh, you know, urgent, but not important, important, but not urgent doing the important, but not urgent stuff is really, I mean, that's, what's going to move the needle. That's what's going to make the difference. Um, mm -hmm. and I mean, I can't honestly, like just the education and the networking alone, like the, the kind of people that you look to get in a room that you and Jake look to get in the room. Like that's, that's that could be my my biggest endorsement for this group and i like the fact is the first things that are there are there first there's not a whole lot of man i see i see other programs and i i love the people that run them so i'm not dogging on those people but there's all this other stuff that you get you know you get this you get that um you know you don't know if you're getting started you you can you can pull crexy lists like you can pull lists of stuff but do you know how to use it? Do you even know what you're looking for? Because you don't have a buy right box. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I think that's one of the things I appreciate the most. And that, that, was, my, that was my thought listening to that. Mm -hmm. You made a great point before I hit the record button on how people can get in the business. I, I mean, I like the value. Let, let's expand on that a little bit because you may not have capital. You may not have, you may have capital, but you may not have time. Mm-hmm. You may have experience, but you don't have capital. Whatever that is to the person listening, I think Jay's got a great and relevant story on how you can break into this business or any business, any any entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. So, you know, when I, I think the real the difference maker was in in getting this deal and getting into this deal was just identifying what the pain points were for my now partner. 
um, and his other partners. And when you don't have, you know, when you don't have experience, you don't have, when you don't have whatever, you know, you can look at that and say, well, you know, I, obviously I can't do it because X, Y, Z, I can't do this. Um, but I mean, you can do that, but you can also look at, you can turn it around and say, what do I have that I can bring to the table? Um, and you just said, you're going to miss out on a lot of deals by having the right financing criteria. Yeah. You're going to miss out on a lot of deals because you can't bring something to the table. And that's really, that's okay. This is not a zero sum game. This has never been a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. The, the aim is to identify what you can do, what you can bring to the table, um, and being willing to, you know, maybe take a little risk, especially if you haven't done a deal before. Um, and you know, taking personal risk is something that I think is super important. I I don't like to take risk with investors capital. I like to take risk with my own capital. Uh, and so I think the lesson there is seek to make somebody else's job easier, seek to make somebody else's life easier. Um, you know, it's like I, I love I love Bill Ham's book, Creative Cash, where he talks about just looking to solve somebody else's problem. Don't go into a seller negotiation saying, this is what I want. This is how I can get what I want. Go in there looking to really, you know, be a go-giver, looking to solve somebody else's problem. And I think that's really the way to achieve success in this business is to put others before yourself. Mm -hmm. I love that. What are your goals for the next three to five years? Where do you see yourself in the next mm -hmm. three to five years? Man, you know, I, it's hard because I, um, everybody asks about goals for the next three to five years. We just found out a few months ago that we're expecting our first, our first child here in May. And so, you know, whatever plans I can make, I know that, uh, you know, you have to, you have to fit a kid into it. Oh, of course you just have, you just said you have six kids. So <laughs> the fact is that shouldn't derail my plans. Um, what I want to do in the in the next three to five years is number one, be a great dad. Number two, be a great husband. And number three, be a great partner for my investors. And what that means practically, the last point is that right now, I don't have a deal that I'm that I have under contract that I'm looking at. I am out there every day reaching out to people on LinkedIn, seeking new investors and seeing how can I be that what I just said to that person, like how can I solve what they want, not necessarily what I want. I just want your capital, but what can I do for you? Um, and how can I, you know, show you that this is something that will change your life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so being, uh, really just putting the right things first in syndication is my goal for the next three to five years, acquire more deals. Absolutely. But, um, but getting the, getting the first things first and, preserving my North star, preserving my integrity is my biggest thing. And having more kids, but we'll leave that for another show. Oh yeah. Show. Oh, well, Hey, look, I mean, now that we, you, you have the first one and I hear people like, Oh, well that wasn't that big a deal. Now we can have more, but before the first kid, they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I still don't know what I'm going to do. So it's, yeah. a, it's, it's very challenging All up in the air, right? <laughs> Jay, where can a listeners get a hold of you? Yeah. So Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm most active on there. J J A Y Bisega B I S A G A. You can also email me at J A Y at ursacapital.com. That's U R S A dash the word capital.com. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to meet up. A young Jay Basaga graduates college, takes him five years to graduate college. It's okay. I'm not going to hold it against him. He goes and works for a unicorn company. But while working that unicorn company, all of a sudden he says to himself, I don't feel as if they're aligned with my values. And I have a really difficult decision here. I'm making really great money. I've just got married. I have a young family. And I don't know what to do. But I know what my parents taught me about the commitment and about the values and about faith and about you know, compromising those, should I still be here? And at a young age, he decided to call it quits, went on his own. He bought his first six units. And like I had mentioned, all of a sudden there's a little lint in his pocket. And he's like, where do I get money for my next deal? He joins Jake and Gino and he understands, hey, I need to put the, the education into it. I went to college. It took me five years to graduate. What's 12 months to learn 
What is 12 months to learn this, this business, this other business, this amazing business where I don't even need my own money. I can go out and get investors, but I have to learn it. And these guys talk about buy right, finance right, manage right. And then there's a syndicate right as well. Let me learn it. And then once I learn it, opportunities are going to come my way because I'm going to be intentional because I'm Jay Bazaga. I am on LinkedIn. I am a beast. Every time I turn on LinkedIn, I see Jay Bazaga on LinkedIn. I'm like, what's going on here? That's okay. I see him, pops up and, and he's out there. He's intentional. And what he says is there's two things that I need to do. I need to source capital, which is what he's doing. And I need to source deals. When there's no deals, he's looking for capital. And when he's got capital and he's got deals, the marriage is made in heaven there. He gets on his phone. He finds a deal. He says to his partner, I'm writing a $75,000 check here. Include me in this deal. I've got skin in the game. And that's how you get done. If you have conviction and you have belief, you couple that with action and things happen. Mm. And there you have him, Mr. Bazaga. That's good, man. Thank you so much, Gino. My brother, my pleasure. Yeah. And I, I just want to end off by telling everybody, I, I don't want any of you who listening to this to make excuses because Jay's I wasn't even 30 when he started. He could have stopped. He could have had that little, those limiting beliefs in his head. And he could have said to himself, I'm too young. I don't have enough money. Apartments aren't for me. My parents weren't entrepreneurs. I'm really a tech guy. But what he did is he sat down and he got clarity in his life. And he wanted to map out his life. And sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to get mm -hmm. into rooms with dissenting thoughts and other people's opinions. And, and I'm so glad that he did that. And that led him to Jake and Gino. And he's just another success story, Jake and Gino. So once again, email address. Yeah. J A Y at Ursa capital.com. U R S A like the star dash capital.com. Thanks Mr. Bazaga for being on. And we will see you all on the next movers and shakers. Take care.